Hello and a warm welcome to this panel discussion on enabling the lowest common denominator, product, agency, and econom economic empowerment of rural women entrepreneurs at the 14th Global Sankalp Summit. As we know, economic empowerment is a critical conversation for us to be having in the context of rural India, and particularly women in rural India. Several studies have shown a direct correlation between women empowerment and growth in GDP. But while research and policy debates have largely focused on financial inclusion and access to credit, we need something more to truly empower rural Indian women entrepreneurs. What is that missing link? And how far are we from plugging that gap? I'm Varsha Meghani, and with me to discuss the topic, I have an eminent panel. Ashish Desai, Director, Development, Monitoring and Evaluation Office at Niti Aayog. Rudra Sen Sharma, Professor of Economics at IIM Kozikor. And Dr. Burnali Bhandari, Senior Fellow at the NCAER. Thank you to all of our panelists. So Ashish, uh, uh, let me start with you. Uh, you and Professor Rudra have carried out extensive research in rural Maharashtra to better understand the factors that lead to economic empowerment of rural women entrepreneurs after controlling for factors like access to finance. So to start off, how do you define economic empowerment for these women? Uh, thanks, Varsha. So I think the first thing we have to take a cue from understanding what exactly is empowerment before we go into economic empowerment. And we embed our thoughts and our research in a seminal work done by Naila Kabir in our paper in 1999. So Naila Kabir articulates it saying that it's an agency to make decisions, which means having access of resources is just not enough but having access of resource knowledge that the resource is available ability to decipher what is good and bad and to make choice and lastly but more importantly it is to execute the option of a choice so when i talk about in economic sense uh one of the dimension that is used in economic empowerment is financial well-being. Do you have enough resources to manage your current and anticipated desire of living, not just cost of living, desire of living, which means what it requires, it's a process. You require resources, which is given by access to capital, microfinance banks, small finance banks. But it is also there is a second dimension that is required, which is you require to have power within a person to have knowledge, self-belief and learning skill, power to take a decision and most importantly, power over access and control of finance. And that's what we define as economic empowerment. When you can take a decision, execute a decision and have controls over the outcome or the earnings from that decision. And that leads to a financial well-being is what we say as economic empowerment or economic well-being of an individual. Right, right. So, um, uh, Professor Rudra, if I can bring you in. Uh, what are those factors that you'll uncover through your research that, um, that lead to economic empowerment as um, Ashish describes it? Thank you, Varsha. Uh, you know, when we think of agency, uh, we could look at something very basic such as health, education, nutrition, uh, decision-making, autonomy, etc. Uh, but in the context of poor women entrepreneurs, when we look at uh, you know, customers of, let's say, a microfinance provider, uh, one way to look at agency is group affiliation itself. So there's a lot of research which says that uh, being part of a peer network uh, like a self-help group or a joint liability group loan gives women uh, agency because they are exposed to what is happening around them. They have a social support structure and they are able to enhance their abilities through that. Now, we are moving beyond that because uh, we are saying that the access to finance is there for most of the women in the uh, 
regions that we are analyzing now moving beyond the group affiliation what about the personal agencies so when we look at personal agencies as i said things like uh, education uh, may not be changed at a certain stage in life but there are other agencies which potentially we can improve so what are those personal agencies so we look at specifically financial literacy the reason is as ashish said uh, these are uh, micro entrepreneurs so they are looking at improving their financial outcomes and therefore we look at financial literacy which is basically the knowledge and skills of uh, taking sensible financial decisions so that is one of the agencies we look at and the second is entrepreneurial orientation which is the attitude or aptitude for entrepreneurship so we see that these two agencies are very important in enhancing uh, empowerment and well-being and we feel that a lot more attention should be paid uh, from policy makers from investors to enhancing these agencies right right uh, so dr bonali uh, how do we um, enhance these agencies be it uh, you know financial literacy or even the uh, intangibles like uh, entrepreneurial orientation whether it's having the aptitude uh, for entrepreneurship how do you enhance these agencies among um, women thank you, thank you varsha um, so the interesting thing that's that it is that you know um, we uh, based on my this our research in ncr we looked at skills and we looked at different gradation of skills the first important thing is to think of rural entrepreneurs there are two kinds of entrepreneurs necessity entrepreneurs and opportunity entrepreneurs rural women entrepreneurs would fall in the uh, necessity entrepreneurs category so which means they are coming from a, a weaker um, socio economic uh, background by weaker i mean it's not they don't have the talent i mean is that they may not have the education so there's a couple of things that are played here one is the so one is the what kind of skills do they need so skills can be of three types but is cognitive that is uh, your ability to read write um, and obviously higher abilities of problem solving uh, which are very important for entrepreneurship think out of the box experimentation and financial literacy happens to be one of the cognitive skills so it's it's not that it's a only skill but it's one of the key skills and within financial uh, obviously there are social emotional skills also and social emotional skills are your ability to uh, communicate ability to relate emotionally manage both yourself and your customers ability to work in a team if you are working with other people so there are again uh, psychological characteristics that go into entrepreneurship and then there is of course a actual technical and vocational skill which could be your talent that you make a particular handicraft or it could be some something that you particularly have some specific skill that you are uh, some specific knowledge or some special like a plumber or a or an electrician type of thing or um, some other thing so it's a combination of skills that is embodied in a person financial literacy is of course one of them uh financial literacy when you look at the reserve bank of india definition very at the very basics is the ability to manage your income ability to manage your expenses ability to is invest and say you know these are the five four and able to take a debt uh, understand loans understand interest rates um, and ultimately uh, um, compute that how much you know how much they save most people do it they just do it orally so but uh, for a business you would need more much more you would need to borrow to expand if you are at all want to expand so a combination of skills define entrepreneurship and um, they have go into entrepreneurship at least at the high level and even if it is necessary entrepreneurship you want to have some degree of those entrepreneurship skills and so when you in the policy if you want to make women entrepreneur uh, entrepreneurship as a source of employment to address our female low labor female labor force participation rate in india what we need to do is actually address these combination of skills um uh, and work towards it i just want to bring in a particular exact alternative example here what seva does seva is this indian ngo which works a lot with women and they are actually not just providing financial literacy but also business um, uh, business skills and along with that they are uh, actually pro providing 
uh, mentorship to women. So there's a there's a uh, very uh, deep literature by Seema Jaitandran. If you look at that literature, uh, essentially the uh, one of the uh, thing is the role model that mentorship plays. Uh, like friends, if you bring a friend to a group that those people, uh, if you have a mentor in a group or you have a friend in a group, the, those women tend to earn much more money. So it's a combination of what I'm trying to say. It's a combination. And for gender, what we found, this is based on SEVA research, what we found uh, that mentor fee for females, mentorship is extremely important. Role models are important, along with, of course, the basic uh, cognitive skills of financial literacy and business training. Um, and we need to look at it together and not just uh, not at one thing at a time because one thing at a time may not may address one particular problem but it may not solve a more holistic issue okay. on that note thank you right so we'll just deep dive into uh, these two agencies that, that you all mentioned financial literacy and entrepreneurial orientation uh, you know, when we talk about financial literacy, uh, this is something several organizations have been working towards for several years. Uh, you mentioned Seva, Mandeshia also has been working on the ground for, for several years. Uh, so what is the progress we've made on this front when it comes to financial literacy? And how does that compare to other emerging economies, whether in Southeast Asia or Africa? Uh, Dr. Bornali, would you want to take this? about that um so yeah i think a uh, lot of a uh, lot, lot of uh, initiatives are being carried out in africa on um, financial literacy uh, definitely and what we find in um, that uh, and in general the literature i'm going with the literature i'm not a ground person uh, going by the literature uh, review a uh, literature search in africa and uh, south america what we find is across the country across the world financial literacy is has been quite focused on and financial literacy uh, has uh, across around the world uh, at in developed or emerging countries financial literacy is part of very much a part of training that is given to women around the world uh, but entrepreneurship orientation is a different thing or orientation is a bit uh, are you willing to take the risk and if you're willing to take the risk are you, are you um, I mean, we have to understand what does entrepreneurship orientation mean and what is driving the entrepreneurship is it necessity is it opportunity. And secondly is it's, are you willing to take the risk because business means risk taking. And so it's a bit of, um, and if there is, if you fail in business, what are the, you know, what are the fallback options? I think that's one thing we need to be clear about in developed countries. We know there are fallback options, the bankruptcy laws. In, again, we are here. We uh, we also have an um, IBC from that perspective. But again, if you think about it, we are talking about rural women. What is the backup that they have? I think we need to think in a more uh, or um, while entrep so entrepreneur orientation has not received much attention. So from that angle, it is uh, it, this is interesting. But I think the Seva research, the research on Seva groups, is showing that it's more than just entrepreneurship orientation and financial literacy um, it's a it's a holistic set of skills and of course mentoring which is uh, very very important that goes in um, so partnership and mentoring goes in very very important and role models that is very very important so uh, if you see a successful women um, female it actually has an impact um, and then that is true around the around the world in all of occupations so uh, around and that's that that literature holds up across the world uh, definitely in africa africa so there's enough evidence but showing that financial literacy actually has a very positive impact on economic um, on economic empowerment of women especially on entrepreneurship right i would right. like to add to what burnali mentioned uh, and having this is my previous experience on the ground across africa and uh, south asia uh, financial literacy is being metamorphosized today into digital financial literacy because of the leapfrogging of uh, the digital technologies that are being used for accessing resource, accessing finance. And again, in the developing world, there is a finer nuance between India and the African context because African context predominantly work on agent banking and wallet while upi has leapfrog giving deep as i put it the value lies in devaluing the value chain 
So you have devalued the devalued the business correspondent model eventually to put hands power in the hands of the borrowers. So that those are the nuances. And as Dr. Bonali mentioned, the emphasis of financial literacy is being is not undermined at all because we find on the ground many banks and financial institutions actually collaborating with NGOs who can build the appropriate capacity required for financial literacy. Um, can I come into what I just want to add to uh, Ashish's point that um, I, I didn't give you a whole bucket list. One of the thing is digital literacy is actually going to be very, very important for um, women entrepreneurship. So financial literacy, digital literacy, and the point that actually mentioned, digital financial literacy. So that's why you need you need a whole set of skills, uh, especially in today's world, to access um, to to be able to access the finance. And and it's not just accessing the finance, as I think Rudra said. It's not about accessing finance. It's also about knowing how to use it in a sensible and smart manner, so that you can actually grow. So uh, for that, you will need business equipment and business training too. Um, so that's, uh, that's, again, sometimes something for the audience to think about as we go further in the conversation. Right, right. Uh, Professor Rudra, you know, when you talk about the socio-cultural setting or even the aspect of having control over one's finances, uh, you know, what role does that play in uh, the economic empowerment of rural women entrepreneurs? And, um, you know, maybe if you have some anecdotes to share from your uh, field work. That would be nice. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Varsha, I think socio-cultural context uh, plays a very important role because what is empowerment in one context may not be empowerment in another context. So I'll start with some general examples and then talk about some uh, know, anecdotes from our field studies. Uh, generally speaking, uh, for instance, you know, uh, in one cultural context, a woman stepping out of the house without an accompanying male member could be empowerment, but it would not be a significant uh, agency or empowerment in another context. So you see the context plays a very important role. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the ability to take decisions uh, for the family. So in one context, the decision for shopping or basic food purchases could be important as empowerment. In another context, that may not be important. Rather, more consequential decisions such as family planning or children's education could be empowerment. Uh, now, coming closer to our research, uh, you know, if you compare, let's say, rural and urban areas. Now, in urban areas, in the face of conflict, uh, a woman leaving the house could be a sign of agency or empowerment. But in a rural context, the ability to uh, you know avoid conflict could itself be an agency or empowerment so therefore you know the context plays a very important role now in our research for instance uh, we are looking at things like savings behavior loan repayment behavior uh, you know insurance purchase by poor women entrepreneurs now in an urban context this need not be empowerment because this is something you take for granted but in a rural uh, context for micro entrepreneurs, this could be a sign of empowerment or a sign of agency. And that is what we are researching. Now, in our case, uh, since we have a fairly uh, you know, homogeneous set of women, because uh, one study that we conducted was in rural Maharashtra. So the cultural context does not vary greatly. Uh, but when we compare rural versus urban, to give you an example, uh, let's say something like uh, taking decisions of your own about saving money or taking a loan. So this varies from rural to urban. So in, in semi-urban areas, uh, women would report that they take these decisions on their own. Uh, whereas in a rural region, they would tend to say that, uh, you know, somebody else in the household takes these decisions for them. So that's how a cultural or uh, socio-demographic differences could play a role in agency and we need to be mindful of these differences because we cannot have one size uh, fits all solutions for improving agency or empowerment. Right, right. Ashish, would you like to uh, add on also uh, to that? Um, yes. Maybe yes. some anecdotes as well? Yes, thanks. And uh, as Professor uh, Rudra mentioned, uh, it is uh, when we talk about the agency, uh, 
um, we have to understand as an entrepreneur, this is a, there is a nuance between self-employed and entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. In classical world, entrepreneurship is about uh, raising capital, series A, seed capital, B capital, and putting it on the LinkedIn. Uh, that's what the image of an entrepreneur comes in. Mm -hmm. But when we look at these people in some literature, they talk about subsistence entrepreneurship, which is more of livelihood generation. Right. And that is an important point of understanding what agencies are required. So when we look at the agencies and we talk about financial literacy, but what is financial literacy? It is actually a composition of four different constructs. First is numeracy. Mm -hmm. Can I do basic plus, minus, addition, uh, subtraction, and multiplication? Second is financial knowledge. Do I have knowledge about what is a savings interest rate? What is a penalty rate? My, uh, then is financial attitude. What is my attitude as Dr. Bornali mentioned about how do I use the loan? How do I uh, do my savings? And lastly, and most importantly, is my behavior. Now, mm -hmm. what we observed over here in our research and uh, anecdotally is that people would be comfortable doing percentages. But the moment you talk about compounding interest and penalty interest in terms of banks, they draw a blank. Right. So in a classical sense, when we talk about numeracy, yes, it's financially literate. But in the context of banking transaction, it is little challenging. Right. So, so that, that, that's what we have to uh, be con uh, mindful about. And secondly, I will draw a cue from what Dr. Bornali mentioned about role models. What we looked at is the necessity of not just access to capital, but access to social capital. Right. These subsistence entrepreneurs are not going out of a market, out into uh, from multiple cities. The point is that if I'm making poppers and pickle, my market size is limited to the village. Mm -hmm. How do I get access to market? That becomes a bigger question now. And as I was just, just sharing, we are, we are in the middle of our uh, randomized control trial of doing access to markets and see how that would change if you are on a P2P WhatsApp group or a Facebook group to start to, to do the marketing. And that's where I think it's the agency or the resource rather of social capital becomes, becomes an important point, which Dr. Rudra mentioned about how do we have the social setting and social context. So that that's what I would like to add. Uh, let me just uh, quickly add that, you know, if we are studying urban educated women entrepreneurs you know the mm -hmm. metrics could possibly be, be business growth scale up investments etc but in the context of poor women entrepreneurs in rural areas as ashish said you know we would be more interested in survival or probably resilience to shocks or maybe saving some money uh, you know to put into the business so th these itself are important as signs of empowerment and not necessarily the metrics that we may use elsewhere right right so just uh, you know for our audience to get a better understanding uh, you know from the subset of women that you all uh, researched uh, uh, how would you rate them on financial literacy and uh, entrepreneurial orientation uh, say on a scale of 1 to 10 10 being the highest so uh, when we look at the sample, and I'm just putting some stats, I'm not giving standard deviation, etc. But average for the for the woman that we studied, which was a size of about uh, thousand plus around, uh, the average financial literacy was at about three point two five around average. Okay, now entrepreneurial orientation is an instra interesting construct. Entrepreneurial orientation again consists of, and uh, Dr. Bornali alluded to that, is about proactiveness, innovation, risk-taking ability, passion, and perseverance. And people, and as Professor Rudra mentioned, people from rural part had certain scores higher on some dimensions. People from semi-urban part had a certain scores on different dimensions. And, and people from uh, urban or peri-urban was was different. Now, interesting point that I would like to add over here is that one observation was that the religion and the caste did not play a role. The same person or the same community people from one, one 
uh, uh, community from a rural part and you compare with with the descriptive statistics in the peri urban or the urban part they had similar behavior a uh, uh, different behavior which means it was the social context in where they are embedded that was playing a role rather than just uh, the 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 exogenous factors of which caste they were born or which religion they had by birth right right got it got it so i'm just going to kind of try to pick your brains uh, you know a little bit more on this uh, why would the financial literacy levels be so low given the fact that you know organizations have been working on the ground in this area for several years um uh, anybody whoever would like to uh, take that up can i come in yes yes please ma'am <laughs> um well, so that's a very interesting thing because um we have um, uh, we have, there's a lot of government initiatives and there's a lot of recognition in the last uh, uh 10 years ago that there that financial literacy and financial inclusion needs to drop in so there has been a lot of effort but what uh, what uh, pertinent what rudra said that essentially it's about uh, that we have uh, the access is no longer a problem so what our financial inclusion went about doing is that they have the first step was getting the financial inclusion the access right so there has been a lot of effort especially in india with the um, there was a scheme introduced in called uh, pmjdy jan pradhan mantri janthan yojana which essentially in uh, that women that people could uh, open uh, zero balance bank accounts um this is an international audience so i'm just breaking it down a little bit a uh, zero balance bank accounts which enabled people to actually open the account Mm -hmm. uh the second step that the government did is that they uh, enabled um uh, subsidies through this um uh, through a network of what we now call the direct benefit transfer so essentially subsidies would flow into the directly into the uh, bank accounts of the beneficiaries that is the cash transfers so this was enabled um, uh, by uh, anyway this, that was enabled and uh, what uh, uh, there's a something called jandan aadhar mobile jam trinity with that framework has uh, enabled uh, the flow of payments um, a much more, uh, flow of payments so accelerate so, so this has created a um, has accelerated that so while we are receiving the payments but financial literacy is a different ball game altogether while there has been a lot of efforts by the government by the state governments by the banks uh, to improve but somehow i think at the at the local level we are not able to uh, translate it down um, to uh, to um, to, uh, to to where where they can use it uh, it's happening at some it's, i think it is much improved now but again uh, you know what needs within the so financial access is, has been play, has been uh, accelerated but not financial inclusion um, and i think financial literacy sorry so financial mm -hmm. literacy is something but you know as i um, we did we have worked on direct benefit transfers um, and one of the, the things as my uh, as i was told that you are talking about financial literacy or even digital literacy but if there is very basic literacy is missing how can you actually overcome that to um, to ensure financial and digital literacy you might get an sms but can you read the sms is actually quite important so yes okay. uh, but we find numeracy is literacy is much harder than uh, alphabets but so this this remains a problem this remains a challenge in our con country where we actually need to overcome we need to not just look at we need to overcome these issues um uh, together so um while we have come uh, we, we have achieved a lot of miles but i think still uh, we still have a lot to go and we find that um i think one of the things that uh, bringing down uh, bringing connecting to your previous discussion we find that membership of uh, membership of the self help groups sgs also help women to actually overcome these uh, said uh, these gaps so we i, I did some uh, work on microfinance and in the very uh, preliminary analysis uh, using india's uh, india human development survey which ncr does and covers 40000 households we looked at the rural women and we found that women who were part of self help groups but then on average tend to be more uh, economically empowered that is uh, in the sense is not in the definition like rudra and ashish defining but generally they could take more decisions 
now at home where or to, whether to visit their natal place so they're they're, they're de definitely or you know how to spend their own money uh, mm -hmm. so those decisions were definitely uh where women who tended to be more of self-help groups members of self-help groups could uh, could the preliminary evidence indicated that they could be they were definitely more in, economically empowered so membership of these groups help and that has but again at the scale level uh which we uh, despite all the initiatives um it tends to lag behind partly is there's been um, partly is that our own uh, lack of literacy itself literacy itself uh, is is acts as a constraint i think that's something to think about as we go forward I'd, I'd like to add to what uh, Dr. Bonali mentioned. Uh, what India as such is numeric literate as large, not necessarily alphanumeric literate. Mm -hmm. What has happened in the past, in the recency is when we look at UPI based transaction or digital transactions, and if you look at the UI UX interfaces, you tend to find more graphical signatures which shows send money, receive money, bank balance, which they can interpret. And that has added to or fostered the literacy levels in terms of numeracy to a certain degree uh, in the Indian context. But it's, it's an effort and the whole schemes and important point, it is not necessarily the finance schemes. It is also the schemes such as Beti Barchao, Beti Pada that will have a spillover effect in the mm -hmm. long term over the financial literacy. Thank you. Back to you. Uh, may, I, may I just quickly add that uh, low financial literacy is, uh, by the way, just not a problem in India. Uh, in fact, in developed countries also, uh, you know, th there are uh, uh, studies which show uh, poor financial literacy, particularly among the poor uh, you know, even among young people. So this is something, you know, obviously it, it affects us. So we got to fix this. Now, we have not done any research on the uh, causes for financial literacy. So I'll be careful here, but I'll still speculate as an educator mm -hmm. that uh, the low levels of financial literacy could also be linked to, as uh, Bornali said, you know, the kind of basic education uh, that we may be providing in our schools, for instance, uh, where concepts are more theoretical and less applied. Uh, but I'm hopeful that with the national education policy, uh, laying emphasis on applied learning, experiential learning, vocational learning, could perhaps fix some of these uh, problems uh, so that we do not have to uh, do as many interventions later on in one's life uh, as we are proposing in our research, where obviously you know, the literacy has already been decided uh, at a younger age. And now we are trying to improve financial literacy through training. But the need may be reduced if some of these gaps can be filled at the school level itself or at the college level. For example, what do you do with the first salary that you receive and you know, buy insurance at a younger age so that your premiums are lower? So those kind of lessons, I think, uh, are lacking uh, at, at early stages and we need to do that. Sure. Actually, yes. actually, I want to add to Rudra's point. In India, I'm talking about India I, um, at a very field level. When we were looking at uh, direct benefit transfers across states, one of the things we asked states whether they have actually uh, introduced financial literacy in school level. So some of the states, I have to say that they have tried to introduce a financial literacy curriculum at the school level. And how do I know this? Because um, our, uh, we find that people who domestically help us, the children come and they say, we want to see what a checkbook is. They don't know what a checkbook is. So, you know, those, this just the idea of what a checkbook is. I mean, obviously, the checkbook may not be useful anymore. But, you know, these ideas are being introduced in school. So hopefully by the time we come to the another uh, five to ten years, we will mm -hmm. be far more financially literate than, uh, than this thing. But remember, remember it's, one thing is to know the tools. Um, the, second, uh, the second is of how to use it because entrepreneurship requires slightly more advanced set of skills than just basic skills because you have to be able to uh, inculcate and expand more. So that's something to think about um, as we go forward. But yes, I think that that as we go towards universal enrollment and more towards and more these introduction of these curriculums in school, we may be able to address the problem in the next five to ten years. The cohort that comes out hopefully will be more literate and financial literate. Uh, yeah. I, I I can't say, but I don't know about Africa, so I'm not commenting on that one. 
Sure. And so inculcating these skills um, to become an entrepreneur, you know, the aptitude, the attitude, etc. Um, is that something also that can be kind of worked on at the school level? Um, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. what are those building blocks that, that are needed to uh, you know, develop that mindset? So, so there are two types of uh, agencies that I would say. One is uh, cognitive and one is non-cognitive. Mm-hmm. Um, th- things like uh, attitude, aptitude are something that you could, uh, you could work on in terms of uh, inculcating that from early age. But on the other side, as uh, we discussed about entrepreneurship, some things uh, such as risk-taking ability, yeah. It is there is limited influence that you could. Yeah. Uh, the something like innovativeness and proactiveness. There is limited influence. Yes, uh, by having role models and having social capital, you can enhance it a little bit, which gets reflected into the the averages, as Dr. Bonali mentioned about the SHG women and not and non SHG. But there is a stark difference between uh, those who have it and those who don't have it. Yeah. In terms of in terms of this, but definitely financial literacy can be worked on. And the reason why it is important is that it has an implication not only from the borrowers, but from the MFIs also, because the more they invest into their borrowers financial literacy, our research also shows about its implication on loan repayment mm-hmm. and loan repayment frequency and product cross sell. So it for financial institutions to have uh, uh, a healthy balance sheet. And as an ex-banker, I would say that we would to go with a uh, CSI index, which was a cross-sell index of 2.75. That means in ideal state, every customer needs to have 2.75 different products from us. Yes. Now, to do that, it is necessary that they have financial literacy. So it is in my interest that I invest into. And that, that is where our research also brings from a policy perspective for, for the financial institutions an implication of what they need to do to, to foster and make their balance sheet more robust and more profitable. Got it. Uh, I'll come back to you on the policy implications um, for MFIs and, uh, and governments. Uh, but just, uh, you know, um, your research, Ash- Ashish, was carried out over a period of three years uh, before, during, and post-COVID. Uh, what was the impact of COVID on the economic well-being of women, and uh, you know how did they respond to it? Yeah. So uh, when we look at COVID, we have to first distinguish. Okay, so let me take a step back and we explain the how do we measure COVID impact. What is the variable that we use to say that this is going to be the COVID? So we actually did three. One mm-hmm. was. Uh, per capita infection rate in the district. And we traced over over month. Second one was uh, we use Google mobility. So we use Google mobility data because if there is a lockdown, the mobility will come down. If there is uh, no lockdown, the mobility will go up. Mm-hmm. And third one was we use uh, for the first time to do such an analysis, uh, nightlight data, geospatial data of NASA. Because if there is a lockdown, there will be inherently lesser activity. The lights will be off in an active business environment. Yeah. And the re- it was like one was done and others two were as a robustness check. And the mm-hmm. results were similar. But there was an important point that came out. Health shock is mm-hmm. not equal to economic shock. Okay. Which means in the first wave, the first wave was lesser intense than the second wave. Mm-hmm. But the economic lockdown was higher in the first wave as compared to the second wave because the administration knew how to deal with it and they opened up the markets. So so which was clear that health shock is not equal to economic shock. And when we talk about uh, COVID impact, we have to be very clear that we talk about, we look at these parameters because your results on repayment and women's behavior would be completely different during the period. So we cannot generalize and we have to trace, is it we are talking about an economic shock or a health shock? But primarily from the paper being around economic well-being and economic behavior, we're talking about economics. One thing that we realized over here is first thing is that your product plays a very important role, Mm -hmm. which has an implication on the supply side. Financial institution typically because of inability to assess credit tend to give one standard product of joint liability group lending to everybody. Mm -hmm. But what we found is 
product which has flexible repayment, which we call as cash credit or an overdraft product, kind of an overdraft product, had a better repayment behavior. Right. Second thing that we looked at in the COVID times is that uh, the physical collection became important for certain products and not for certain products, depending on financial literacy of an individual. Right. Okay. And the third product, the third thing that we looked at is what type of livelihood was the person doing? Mm -hmm. That had a bearing on the repayment behavior. Yeah. That was very important because, and, and I'll quote uh, one of the quotes that I, I, I heard over there is, and it was in Hindi and I will just say it in Hindi, uh, though it's an, and try to translate it into English as well. One was that the one person said that I live in the house and live in the house or live in the house. Do I, do I stay home and live or do I go out to earn a living? If I stay out to live, I'm going to die because I don't have money. That means I'm forced to go out. Yes. And who were allowed to go out? Those were the people who were of essential service and then they started gradually opening up the behavior. So we found out people's behavior of repayment or savings changed when we looked at livelihoods such as catering, food production. Mm -hmm. veterinary services ancillary veterinary services but was not was was relatively challenged when we look at people who were doing uh sewing and were mm -hmm. making bags mm -hmm. uh, and these becomes an important dimensions to capture of of building uh building the uh, the financial well-being because most of the women have got more than one occupation to keep right. the sustenance going and mm -hmm. that's how they do the risk mitigation. Yeah. Got it. So, um, you know, we, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah, please. Pasha, sorry to, uh, the, I actually, uh, the question that you asked Ashish, I want to add to his point. Please. Yes. I think uh, this only relate to something Rudra said. So it's in India, um, particularly, you know, because you have very uh, theory based skills or what we call oral road skills, uh, that how to teach uh, you know can we you ask the question can we actually encourage entrepreneurship to schools how do we encourage women or women to become entrepreneurs or anyway on bring uh, encourage entrepreneurship uh, to school so what what i just want to emphasize that it is possible if we change the way of teaching so i just want to read out to you what we in our research we found that what do entrepreneurs need they need self-confidence they need interpersonal skills it is responsiveness towards various stakeholders, attitude to work, stress management, social sensitivity, judgment and decision making, negotiating deals, leadership, coordination, problem solving, emotional intelligence, just to name a few. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm asking you and asking the audience here and asking my co-panelists also that why can't, why can't some of these skills, yes, they're individual attributes, the risk taking is an ability. But the, why can't the self-confidence, ability to negotiate, why can't these skills start right from day one? They can be taught in our schools. You know, you can teach, you know, you, you can teach the same thing in a different way. The pedagogy becomes very important. Teamwork, if you give individual homework or you can give homework to a team, to a group. And I mean, Rudolf was his teaching, um, he will know. So the difference is when you give individual um, answers and you work in a team to give an answer, there is always one person who say, complain about it, <laughs> not complain about it. So, so, you know, ability to work together as a team, ability to negotiate, ability to bargain is, 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 is a skill, right? And how to get out the better of it is, is a skill that can be taught in class. And you don't have to, I'm not saying that you need a special class for negotiation in MBA, like an MBA. But in school, you can teach the class. You can teach the class in a different way that will inculcate those those skills in class itself. Emotional intelligence or sensitivity can be taught in class. Class itself that these skills can be then you know brought up. So by the time the kid gets out of class, whatever class that they can allows them, and then they um, go to school, uh, go to uh, go to outside work, or you know they want to start a business. They will at least have those some set of those basic skills which they could have used. I'm, I'm again, I'm not saying that uh, everything can be taught in school, but I'm just saying is our school system need to change so that they can need to catch them young so they become a part of the system. I, I mean, that is that self confidence 
uh, is this thing. And you wouldn't believe me, but even in graduate school, I went to a U.S. graduate school myself. The first thing I was told in make one of the things as I was graduating out, I was told that make eye contact. In India, women are told not told to make eye contact. So when you're negotiating with the customer, it's very important to make eye contact. You know, so, so some of these interpersonal skills, negotiating skills, anger management skills, is something that is taught in all the vocational schools in India is how to manage your anger. Again, with women, that's not a particularly problem, but uh, women don't negotiate. Women don't know bargaining. I'm not talking about just bargaining at home, but bargaining outside with your customer. Those things, those things can be inculcated right from the beginning in school. So when the time they get out, specific entrepreneurship things is just then adds uh, adds, um, adds 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 this ability to um, uh, to uh, you know further specialize in one particular entrepreneurship or uh, particular vocation. So it is yes. I Thanks. particularly think that that is it is definitely possible uh, if we look at our uh, education system in a different um, in a different way then our PT up change our pedagogy in a different way that it is definitely possible to teach entrepreneurship skills right from day one and, um, and which brings which brings us to the the paper that i i mentioned of naila kabir because what what the paper also mentions and beautiful example dr bumnali it mentions is that empowerment is a process it, yes. empowerment is an is a process through which you achieve an outcome and this is exactly what we require to have that process there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll just add that. Thanks. Right. Yeah. So we really need to work on those building blocks um, early on. Right. So um, just coming back to, uh, you know, covariate shocks, uh, whether it's COVID or natural disasters, uh, you know, in the absence of a safety net, which is the case in India, uh, insurance products take on a greater significance. Um, uh, Professor Rudra, can you talk about how financial literacy impacts, you know, not just insurance, but also savings and lending, which, you know, uh, are those three dimensions of financial well-being? Uh, yes, uh, Varsha, we have actually conducted rigorous statistical analysis to establish that uh, financial literacy has a causal impact on take up of insurance, saving uh, behavior, and repayment of loans. So uh, this causal impact, which mm -hmm. means you know, higher the financial literacy, better will be uh, voluntary purchase of insurance or higher propensity to save, uh, is a great uh, policy finding because potentially it means that uh, you know all is not lost. So even though. Uh, one generation did not learn these things at school, but it's not still too late. So while we were talking about the need to uh, teach these things at the school level, that's going to help, you know, when the next generation enters the labor force. But for the current uh, segment of uh, poor entrepreneurs that we were talking about, uh, what we are saying is that you could actually design training for improving financial literacy so that it will lead to better insurance take up higher savings and therefore make them more resilient to shocks and uh, not only through this statistical analysis but in another study we actually uh, are doing a randomized control trial where we are imparting uh, financial literacy skills and as uh, Bornali mentioned digital financial literacy which is probably more important and you would think that it cannot be taught at a later stage in life but we are showing that training interventions do improve financial outcomes and build that resilience uh, in the VUCA world that we are living in. Right, right. So one, uh, one thing I would add to our from our findings that we did statistically mm -hmm. uh, it is also shown that some of the products like insurance when you control for a variable like group membership of an SHG it has a positive impact which means it is based on the group buying they also do but not necessarily savings so where I'm coming from is that the products don't necessarily behave similarly across for the same financial literacy there are different product behavior depending on for the same financial different product behaviors and on the other aspects like family size family support group membership that also plays a role for certain products like insurance right so i suppose then from an mfi point of view product innovation becomes key absolutely absolutely 
Right. So could you elaborate on, you know, some of the takeaways from your research uh, for MFIs in particular? Yeah. So uh, first and foremost, when we look at the COVID impact, and I will first talk about COVID and then generalize it. Yeah. While we look from the borrower perspective, it is important to also look from a supply side. Smaller mm -hmm. MFIs who had concentrated portfolios in mm -hmm. particular geography uh, where stringent lockdown uh, because lockdowns also happened in waves across different states because health is a state topic, yeah. are at the propensity of having higher portfolio at risk or defaults, mm -hmm. which means from an MFI perspective, it is important to de-risk yourself by appropriately using scoring to create newer products. Some products which would be meaningful for Professor Rudra may not be meaningful for me and might be different for Dr. Burnali. So risk-based pricing becomes extremely important. And our paper that we have actually can be used as a tool by microfinance companies and SFBs to start scoring people to, to try to fit into a particular credit score. Second important finding that we found out was it did not matter where if you own the house mm -hmm. or if, if you own the shop rather, but it mattered where the shop was. Right. Because during lockdown, the markets opened first in rural areas. And this behavior is different in urban areas. But in mm -hmm. rural areas, it mattered where you own the shop. And seldom do we ask those questions when we do a credit scoring. Which has an impact on what should be the you know uh, what should be the scoring that we do it for uh, uh, for this segment of the borrowers or customers. Third thing that I think was important is that there is a ability of learning, or rather we call it there is a, there is a kind of an endogeneity that sets in when you start performing an activity which means you introduce even a small product and combined with lending of 20 rupees a day saving or 10 rupees a day saving, people who have that product along with lending have a higher propensity to repay as compared to not having that product. So it is not, it, one of the findings was that it was not just about, about having a lending product or a savings product, but also a bundling of product to enhance a particular behavior. If I if I if I learn, I understand it. But if I start doing it, it becomes a habit, and that that actually that actually helps. So so I think when we look at the policies or when we look at inst for my what it means for microfinance institutions, it is not just restricted to the betterment of their customers, but it has a strong impact on their own risk management balance sheet and portfolio. And which, of course, means that they would have a uh, lower cost of capital, etc. But not mm -hmm. going into that, it, it becomes a supply side solution or a point also, not just demand side, borrower side focus. Right, right. And from a uh, from the point of view of policymakers, uh, what are the key takeaways from from your research, Professor Rudra? Would you like to take them? Uh, okay, so I think uh, you know, as I was uh, alluding to earlier that this uh, finding that you can make a difference through training, uh, which will then lead to, uh, you know, improvement in well-being of women entrepreneurs in the rural areas. So this is a huge, I think, implication for policy because it means that the government can do a number of things uh, mm -hmm. to increase financial literacy. For example, the government could provide grants or encourage or incentivize funding agencies to provide grants for financial literacy training. Uh, one very practical mechanism would be to uh, allow CSR spending uh, to be uh, to include you know training or, or financial literacy training. So you know spending on financial literacy training could be made as an admissible CSR activity for financial institutions. So that could give a big boost to uh, improvement in financial literacy skills leading to uh, better economic empowerment. Uh, so this is uh, from the point of view of improving agency. Uh, mm -hmm. However, let us not also neglect uh, the role of resources. Now, when it comes to resources, the typical 
uh, solution seems to be to give more money or provide more physical capital. But one of the findings we have is an intangible resource such as access to a marketplace itself can enhance economic well-being. So if the government could support uh, rural micro entrepreneurs to accessing, in our case, we find access to a digital uh, marketplace uh, opens up markets to them, which otherwise they would not have had access to in their own villages. So such complementary set of policy options can lead to improvement in well-being from, from a government policy side. Right, right. Uh, Dr. Bernali, would you like to share any final thoughts? Uh, we have about four minutes left. Any any final thoughts? Um, I just uh, uh, I just want to add is that uh, again we, uh, we need to look at both um, what Rudra's point that we need to look at things in a holistic manner, both sure. in terms of skill sets, soft skill sets, or even uh, with their or the research that uh, it's not just about access to finance, but your location of the shop that matters. Um, we know that uh, in in there's a whole, there's a whole thing thing in pricing of housing called hedonic pricing. Hedonic uh, is this thing. So similarly, you know, here location of shops matter. So you need to look at it, look at the whole thing in a holistic manner. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to, uh, um, you know, really think about entrep women entrepreneurship as a as a option for women and also to improve the overall female labor force participation. Um, I think that's that's the thing. You can't just have one intervention, but have a holistic interven set of interventions. Yeah. That's 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 the 360 degrees approach is the right way, and that's why uh, this um, social cultural context becomes important. The differentiation between urban and rural women. Um, this thing, but I think in general for India in, across uh, across whether across urban and rural, I think the one thing we realized um, is that. And our skills approach. I uh, just want to add to the last line is that while I think education system needs to improve, pedagogy needs to improve, but everything needs to have a gender component uh, to it um, for males and um, for males to recognize and to be able to understand. So it starts again, catch them young, and for females also, the self confidence, uh, yeah. the ability to believe in themselves is very very important. Um, and this 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 needs to be inculcated right from the beginning to recognize their own talent and be proud about it and you know, speaking communication skills in public um, just uh, this thing those 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 need those basic set of skills need to be inculcated right so gender uh, where we found that one thing is having an overall holistic approach and one needs specific set of skills to sit down with women and you know uh, and give them that gender skills. So they have, because they have to, it's, it's, they have to overcome the overall systemic issues and they have to overcome traditional, uh, sets outside attitudes of how women are perceived that. So together uh, can help them to think beyond uh, the, what we call the, you know, what, what they think is their uh, ability to achieve. And beyond that, if we want to achieve, achieve that, we need to think of a uh, gender package, uh, to, to everything. Um, so they, they have a double uh, sort of double barrier to face. Uh, so that that's something we need to work with. Indian, I'm talking about Indian women per se, uh, may not be a problem in other countries. Um, so that that is uh, that's something we need to think about as we go forward. It's and that 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 by the way also works for other socioeconomic weaker groups because they need to be get over these challenges so that they need specified uh, interventions. Which can help them to overcome uh, the weaknesses, um, uh, weaknesses. And then I can tell you from my own experience that when I was in grad school, one of the things that just you know making eye contact is important when you are making a presentation, and it is absolutely uh, or making just talking. Um, whereas uh, you know we are naturally taught not to make eye contact. It's a very small thing, but these kind of these interventions help us to learn. So that's why something everything cannot be taught in a class. So the role of mentorship becomes very very important. Um, also, as we go forward. So just to sum up, to, to you know to truly empower rural women entrepreneurs, we need to go beyond financial inclusion and look at providing them with a suite of services, products, skill sets, both hard and soft, which would ideally begin at the school level, like you all mentioned. Um, only then will we achieve the outcomes that we desire. 
So thank you so much to our panelists, uh, Ashish, Professor Rudra, Dr. Bornali. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you to the audience for tuning in. Thank you, Varsha. I would like to just end by saying that we need to collectively acknowledge and provide spaces, voices, and choices to the woman at the premier. Thank you. On that note, thank you so much. Thank you, Varsha. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you, Varsha. Thank, thank you, Sautab. Thank you, Bonali. Thank you, Dr.